What I'd like to do now is talk a little bit about the background, how I see the workshop, why I uh, organized and uh, initiated this gathering, in which I tried to get uh, many of, I was not able to get everyone, but many of the leading scholars in charism today. Uh, I thought it would be a good opportunity to bring together some old friends and also some younger colleagues. I'm glad to see we do have a mix of ages and experience. And I think it's time to reevaluate some of what we've been doing in Karaite studies. And I think there are three aspects of that. First of all, where were Karaite studies 20 or 30 years ago? What has changed in these last 20 or 30 years? What each of us is now doing in Karaite studies? And what will be in the future? Maybe some sort of <coughs> wish list. So I asked people to keep in mind when they gave their talks these different aspects, where we've been, where we're now, and where we're going. Now I've noticed that some of the talks are very specific, so even on talks which are specific, I think that in the discussion period we have to try to draw out and, and come to some general conclusions. So as I said, I want to make it into a real workshop uh, exchange of ideas, discussion. There's lots of time, we've allocated uh, sufficient time for both the, the, the presentations and the discussions. Uh, I tried to cover most fields. I don't think I totally succeeded. We'll talk about some of the fields perhaps that aren't going to be covered. And I also wanted to work, reach out to a wider audience since Karaite studies is not the most well-known field among Jewish studies, which is one of the reasons why we're having a public uh, event at Ben Svi on Wednesday night. And there's another aspect to the workshop, which is the opportunity to interact with the largest Karaite community in the world, namely the community here in Israel. Now, before I came to Israel many years ago, uh, I had studied Karaism to a certain extent, but I had met, as far as I knew, only one Karaite up till then. It was an elderly woman in Texas who had vague remembrances of growing up in a Karaite family, even though now she was a member of a Rabbinite synagogue. I'd never been to a Karite synagogue, I'd never seen Karaism in action. Uh, it's sort of like in many places in the world today where there's Jewish studies without Jews. It's, it's possible to do it, but uh, it's advantage to also have the context uh, of what we're doing. It's not just in, the, in this university, we talk, like to talk about applied studies, applied uh, yeah work, research. So this is somewhat to apply it to actual communities. And I would guess there are people in this room who also have never yet been to a uh, Karaite synagogue or seen a Karaite uh, service. And I thought this would be a good opportunity to provide that opportunity. Now it's true you don't have to know anything about contemporary charism to understand a text from a thousand years ago. Um, but Perhaps not everything should be theoretical. And it's interesting to see what's happened to charism over the centuries, and those of us who try to do more than just a thousand years ago, but through the whole uh, breadth of Karaite studies from the beginning to the present, uh, it's useful to see where the present is uh, going. I'm often asked how I got involved in Karaite studies, and I decide my standard answer is that I thought it would be interesting and by the time I found out it wasn't, it was too late. <laughs> uh, and there are repetitive and unoriginal aspects of the uh, Karaite tradition, but I think still there's a lot of the Karaite tradition and the Karaite research which enriches Jewish studies in general. One goal that I've seen over the years is what in America's, American education is called mainstreaming. Namely, instead of being a separate branch of Karaite studies, the Karaite studies be part of Jewish studies in general. And just like other groups for whom mainstreaming is difficult, whether it's women's studies, ethnic studies, mainstreaming in an educational system of different uh, groups, there is a problem of mainstreaming of Karaite studies. I think partially lack of interest and partially lack of knowledge. There's a certain non-acceptance of charism as part of Jewish studies. Uh, despite the obvious relevance. How many times does one see comments or <coughs> discussions of Jews and Karaites rather than Rabbinite Jews and Karaite Jews? Some of those discussions are promoted by the current 
Eastern European Karaites who do not see themselves as Jewish, which we'll discuss later. Uh, but there's traditionally been a Jewish reticence to accept other forms of Judaism as, as legitimate. And that should not affect scholars of Judaism, and I think to a certain extent it does. People don't have the mindset to think of charism as part of the larger Jewish experience. So let me start out by talking about the past and how I see the history of Karaite studies. Before the 19th century, those people who were interested in the Karaites could be basically divided into Christian Hebraists and Rabbinite Jews who had vague ideas about charism. The Christian Hebraists, as many of you know, saw the Karaites as a type of Jewish Protestantism, the 16th, 17th century especially, interest in Karaites as the original Judaism, as the true Judaism, the Judaism of Jesus. Uh, among the Protestants, they saw this was a Judaism which had not been corrupted by the Talmud, just as Protestantism was the Christianity, not polluted, corrupted by Catholicism. Rabbinite Jews, when they knew about Karaites, usually had not very much good to say about them. Karaite was a term of opprobrium, such as in the 17th century, there were uh, returning conversos to Judaism were accused of being Karaites, basically because they had questions about the oral Torah, and but the, so the term was, was thrown about, but no real, one could not say there was any uh, scholarship about Karaism. Uh, there were ca communities in which there was interaction, whether it was in Egypt or Eastern Europe. Uh, the Rabbinites were certainly aware of Karaites, and the Ramah, Rabbi Moshe Israelis, in the 16th century, prohibited intermarriage between the Rabbinites, Jews, and Karaites a prohibition which is generally upheld among Ashkenazi communities to, same, to this day, even though the Rad Baz, Rabbi Dabi ben Abu ibn Zimra, in Egypt at the same time, was permitting such marriages. And we know from the Geniza to both the marriage contracts, which show that they were, in, there were intermarriages. Occasionally a rabbi showed interest, whether it was Joseph Solomon del Medigo, Yashar of Kandia, but... <coughs> Carries it was not very much on the rabbinite Jewish radar screen. Of course, there was no such thing as Jewish scholarship, Jewish studies as such before the 19th century. And when the Wissenschaftes Judentums began in the 19th century, charism was part of the study. And perhaps the person who was always get mentioned in the 19th century Wissenschaft is Morris Steinsteiner. Steinsteiner edited the Eitz Chaim, or helped edit, I'll talk about that this afternoon, of Aaron Ben Elijah, it came out in Leipzig in 1841. He cataloged the Leiden collection, uh, the Warner collection, which had much Karaitica. Uh, he worked very hard trying to figure out how to uh, describe Karaite literature because the situation was uh, very unclear. Part of the reason for the lack of clarity was the work of the other great 19th century figure that should be mentioned, who was Abraham Firkovich. Firkovich, the collector, the polemist, the, polemist, the printer, um, was very important, and we today we benefit from his collecting and his activities, but he was not, charitably, he was not very careful, and uncharitably, he... Um, how should I say? He distorted many of his finds. Uh, Steinschneider has, has some choice words about Firkovich, even in his uh, obituary to Firkovich. Steinschneider did not uh, mince words and did not uh, con concern himself with uh, respect for the dead, even. Um, we have other. Uh, and, and the Firkovich editions, uh, uh, some of those editions from Gozlov or Upatoria are very important because they are our only printed editions of many Karaite classical works, but they are censored, and those that came from Byzantium, the Greek was left out, and one had to be used very carefully. Most of them really should be redone, uh, should be uh, re republished. 
mentioned Simcha Pinsker, or only could take had money out, who depended upon uh, uh, depended upon uh, Firkovich. Pinsker is by now has a lot of important material, but again is much dated. Few other names that are hardly ever mentioned in the context of Jewish studies altogether: P. F. Frankel, Julius Fürst, I. M. Yost. Uh, these names have been forgotten, but they were pioneers of Karaite uh, Karait studies. Um, so in the 19th century, there's much mis disinformation, but there's also some progress. And what's interesting is how Wissenschaft included Karaism, especially Eastern European Karaites, at the exact same time when Eastern European Karaites were beginning to remove themselves from Judaism. So it was interesting that the Karaites, even though there were relationships between Karaites and the uh, the Wissenschaft people and the Maskilim, and Firkovich has much correspondence, suddenly the groups are moving apart rather than coalescing, which might have had an effect as well how Karite studies developed. I think in the 19th century and even into the 20th century, the main interest of scholars was the problem of Karite origins. There is an assumption, according to the rabbinic sources, that Anand was the founder of Karism and a, important uh, landmark was Abraham Harkavy's edition of Sefer Avanan Sefer Mitzvot, and then later on Schefter found material in the Geniza, so that Anan was seen as the prototypical Karai, the founder of Karism. Um, at the time, there's also problems and uh, confusion in terms of chronology, the um, mistaking of Yaakov Akir Kassani and Yusuf al-Basir, uh, al Yaakov being Abu Yosef and his work, O Road to Migdalim, the, the Lights and the Towers, and Yosef al Basir is Yosef Haroe, the euphemistically the blind. Steinschneider, in fact, said it's not time yet to write a history of Karaite literature. Uh, there was some interest in Karaite <coughs> thought at this time. There are early editions of Yefet ben Eli's commentaries, the people here who have a number of Yefet experts can tell us uh, what their value is today. Uh, and the term Karai continues to be thrown around as an insult in the Orthodox Reform debates in Germany, whereas the Orthodox claim the Reform are Karaites because they ignore the oral Torah. The Reform answered that the Orthodox were Karaites because they were wedded to the text and were not able to see any development and have organic Judaism, rather a, uh, a uh, ossified type Judaism. In other words, Karaite was still used in rabbinic circles as a term of insult. Uh, the beginning of the 20th century, there began to be serious uh, textual studies. The two people to mention, especially Samuel Poznanski, who died in 1921, was a rabbi, a pulpit rabbi in Warsaw, and wrote an encyclopedia of Karite studies, an encyclopedia that is still exists in the Poznanski collection in the National Library and has been worked on our own as, as, as shaking his head, yeah, it's been worked on for years and years and years, something which never got the funding to come out, and something which could not be published a hundred years later without much revision. But it's a standard work, uh, David Sclair has also worked on it, and knows the, the material there. Uh, the other person to mention is Jacob Mann, who died in 1940, the second volume of Text and Studies. Interesting that as uh, Mann was writing and as research, he was able to do in St. Petersburg, where it became Leningrad. Um, and as the book came out, by the time the book came out, the, uh, the libraries were closed. He died in the middle, right? 1940. I don't know. I think it came out around the time of his death. But in any event, he was still able to use material in St. Petersburg, and then that material closed up. Uh, in the mid to late 20th century, the two names that come to mind are Leon Nemoy, who died in 1998, and George Vido, who died in 1981. Nemoy uh, might have been born before Vido, who lived to be late 90s. And their two test texts that they published are extremely important. Nemoy's edition of Kirkasani's uh, Orotomi Dalim, uh, Anwar Maraki, and uh, Vido's edition of Abbasir's Muktawi, I'll talk about later. Um, if we look at this list of scholars, we see that some were quite prominent, some were less so. 
but there's no tradition of Karaite scholarship. I tried to explain this in the lecture I gave in Memory of Goitain, which was uh, published a few years ago, uh, why these students did not, why these scholars did not have students to carry on. Some of them died in an early age, some of them succumbed to mental illness, some had non-academic positions, uh, many had students with other interests. Uh, Leon Nemoy, who was a great textual student, because of an injury in the Russian Civil War, uh, was not articulate, was not able to talk uh, clearly, and also uh, never had an academic position, only a librarian position. In the same article, I talked about some of the handicaps of Karite studies. There are objective difficulties such as language. Uh, not everyone is Don Shapiro with his uh, knowledge of languages, and we wish his father, Rafua Shleiman, I hope Don can join us as soon as possible. Uh, the problem of access, uh, the lack of basic work, uh, but now we have bibliography, we have the catalogs I mentioned, the closure of the libraries in what was then the Soviet Union. Um, I remember the days when we used to say that it's too bad that we have no access to the libraries in the Soviet Union and all the our conclusions have to be tentative. Nowadays we say too bad there is access, there's so much material that now we really have to work, work hard on it. Uh, there's also no support for Karite studies in Jewish communities. As Jewish studies began to flourish, this was not a major concern of funders of Jewish studies, Karite studies. And, there's still, and there are no Karite communities uh, which could support scholarship. I dare say they had a hard enough time supporting themselves. Uh, and the, therefore, the interchange between the Karite community and academia, which we'll talk about a little bit on Wednesday night and Ben Svee, we haven't had the same phenomenon as we had in Jewish studies in general. I think that brings us more or less to today, very quick overview. I don't know if there was a time in the past when a workshop like this could have been convened with so many people involved in the field. In 1990, Jeffrey Khan and Chagav uh, and Shammai and I, and I don't think anybody else here, was at a conference in Paris where a uh, Catholic priest, Six Denier, try to set up a society for the love of, of Karaite studies, uh, but nothing ever came out of that, as far as I know. Uh, also in the, the 90s, there was a bulletin uh, of uh, Karaite studies, des études Karaite, that came out of, a uh, volume or two came out of, in France. Again, nothing uh, came out of that. Um, there were some scholars who I wanted to have here who couldn't uh, come, and some were invited, uh, some I couldn't invite because of budgeting considerations. But we have in this room really the representatives of, the, the, it seems to me, the major representatives of Karaite studies around the world. Um, many disciplines are represented. One discipline which is not represented is the social sciences. Uh, there has been work, some <coughs> social scientific work on charism, Karaite communities. I question the, the, the value or the, the level of this work. I think part of the problem is that even to do sociology of a group, whether sociology of the Jews, sociology, Rabbinite Jews or Karai Jews, one has to know something about the history and the classic uh, texts of that uh, group. And it's very hard to find a good sociologist or anthropologist who also can control texts. Talk about milestones. I put over there a book display. I tried in the back row, I don't, or I don't know, on the table to be people books produced by people who are sitting here. In the back row, some other books. Ofer T. Roche Becker asked me to put there uh, the uh, a uh, printout of the covers of her book, which is has appeared or is about to about to appear. At least there's a cover, <coughs> two volumes. So we have that as well. Um, Barry Wolfish, who has landed? Has landed. Has landed. <laughs> okay. We'll talk about the bibliography, which I, which I think is the biggest book over there. Um, I want to mention the Ben Svee Cataloging Project and David Square, who's here with us. And just regret that the project is, uh, seems to be petering out before it's fully completed. Um, there's the Brill Microfiche Collection, which I uh, encouraged my, my university and library to buy. And now I realize that slowly most of everything on there is getting online for free. 
Uh, <laughs> there's been a great amount of edition of texts of Yevon Ben Ailey done by a number of people in this uh, group. Uh, and the grammar work, the work in Karite grammar, things that I knew nothing about, and despite reading it, still have difficulty knowing something about it. Uh, but certainly the foremost representatives of that field are here with us today. And cemeteries, I don't know if that's the Karite future, but certainly all the work <laughs> that uh, Don Shapiro and the, and the, uh, and the uh, delegations from the Ben Zvi Institute. I have his book, the Shufukale uh, Cemetery book. He's also submitted a Mangup, also the Crimea Cemetery book. And basically what they've had to do is rewrite Firkovich's Avnezi Karon, Firkovich's great collection of Karite uh, tombstones, uh, which is a combination of Karite tombstones and Firkovich's forgeries. Uh, so this is, all this work has had to be redone, and uh, that's another great uh, um, contribution. A little bit of Karite poetry. There's a new book on Moses Derry's poetry. Philosophy, I'll talk about that this afternoon. And there's Yosef Al-Gamil's Tiferet Yosef project. Um, those works do not meet standards, normal academic standards of publication, but they certainly have brought a great number of texts to uh, the attention of the general community and to the, the Karite community themselves, and many of us here, I'm sure not every one of them here, uses those texts, but we should be used uh, carefully. Uh, we had hoped to meet with Rabbi al Gamil in Ashton on Wednesday, but uh, for medical considerations, he apparently won't be able to make it, so we wish him also a refuah uh, shleima. So uh, the book exhibit there is is like a museum. Yeah. I guess you can touch it. Don't, don't, don't take it, please. <laughs> <laughs> now, some of the issues that I want to talk about, uh, I think that we should talk about, um, or open questions, which I think we should think about. First of all, it's history and historiography. When I think about what's been done in the last 20 years, the question that pops up to me is, what happened to Karite origins? That used to be the only issue which people discussed. I mean, Anon, the beginning of Karaism, and after that, no one cared, at least not among Rabbinite Jewish historians, or historians of Rabbinite Judaism. Uh, it was of interest because of what it told us about Judaism, about pluralism, about uh, sectarianism, about the different uh, strands in Judaism. Uh, not necessarily what it told us about Karaism. In other words, people interested in Karaite origins were interested in Rabbinism more than Karaism. Uh, but it seems to, that now no one's talking about that. Uh, the break between Ananites and Karaites is accepted, at least among the students of Karais, uh, Karism. I think if you look in the general Rabbinite world, Anan is still considered the founder of Karism. And despite Nemoy, Ben Shammai, and Gil, uh, if you ask people about Karism, oh yes, you know, they think they have some idea what Anan said, they think that's Karism through all the generations. I also, in the same Goitain lecture, discussed this idea that Karaites object to the use of medicine. And uh, you find it in almost every book of what's called Jewish medical ethics, or the Jacobovitz, or Bleich, or others, all compare Rabbinite Judaism, which accepts medicine fully, and Karaite Judaism, which rejects any healing on the basis of what Anand might have said. And as I point out in, the, uh, in, my, in my article there, that it's interesting that you have Aaron ben Joseph Harofe, you have many, many Karaites who were doctors, and Karaites were some of the most prominent doctor, doctors in early modern Lithuania. So th this idea that Anan is all of charism is obviously false, but as I said, very little bit of work has been done on that. Uh, the connection to the Dead Sea Scrolls is still a matter of controversy. Uh, I thought uh, Meir and Yoram can discuss it here, Meir and Palia also will become, I hope will be able to come. Which, to her mother. Um, but Yoram actually wanted to talk about exegesis rather than history. Uh, so I don't know of any uh, new attempts at breakthroughs on the issue, and I think maybe Moshe Gil has said the final word, uh, but is it really true there's nothing more to say? In terms of historiography, Fred Astrin 
discusses all pre-modern approaches, and those approaches became the standard among contemporary Israeli Karaites, whether it's uh, Al Gamil or Rabbi Chaim Levi. Uh, on the other hand, we have Eastern European Karait historiography, which has been discussed by Phil Miller, Don Shapiro, Mikhail Kizilov, and the modern Eastern European Karait attempts to reconstruct their history. Uh, something to think about why the historiography goes off in different directions. And in general, the question of uh, this idea of Karaism and, and Rabbinism as being two totally separate uh, streams of Judaism has been questioned by Marina Rustow in her recent book. Uh, another thing we should ask is what is the value of Karaite traditions? When Karaite writers discuss their history, is there any historical value to it or do we accept it up there? Consider it only to be apologetics or uh, <coughs> tendentious uh, explanations. A question that's been uh, bothering me for a long time is the ninth century. Um, I think we know too little about the ninth century. We don't know how it feeds into the 10th century schism. For instance, the early grammarians, we now consider Karaite uh, uh, grammarians, the ones in Persia that uh, Jeffrey and others here have written on, um, what's particularly Karaite about what they've done? The early Arabic Bible translation, the translators, we know now about the translations were done before Sa'adja. Were these Karaite translations? Were they Rabbinite? Was there a difference between Karaism and Rabbinism? What about the Masranim, the, the Masoretes and Tiberius? What, what relationship do they have to Karaism, if any? Um, do we know anything more now about the ninth century, which will help us discuss Karaite origins or the, uh, the emergence of Karaism? Because um, after all, this is the, the, the century where the first people to use the term, B'nai Mikra or Balei Mikra, we have a figure like al Kamas, and no one knows his uh, institutional, denominational affiliation. Turning to exegesis, I think we've had much progress because of various Yefid projects, and the concept, for instance, the concept of Mudawan has made its way into the consciousness of students of charism. But what about general students of Jewish exegesis? Uh, what did Karite attitudes toward biblical text and authorship Tell us about Karaism itself, about the Karaite theology of the halakha. Grammar, as I asked Aaron, who promised to discuss it, what makes Karaite grammar Karaite? I'm reading Nadja's book, a uh, fascinating reading for someone who doesn't understand it at all. Um, I haven't quite figured out what's Karaite about it, so I'm at least going to ask the people here to explain it to me. Okay, Maybe I'll be able to understand it. Karaite literature was uh, progressed under the studies of Rina Drury, blessed memory, uh, but since then, very few people have taken up the challenge of discussing her theories, or I know not everybody has accepted her theories. I'm glad that Miriam Goldstein will be talking about literature today. And about Karaite thought, what's the relationship between uh, Karaite thought and the rest of Jewish thought? Does the denial of the oral Torah make a difference to questions of theology? I like to say that if you look at the Karaites, they accept 12 and a half of Maimonides' 13 principles. Um, so is there something specifically Karaite about Karaite thought or philosophy? And it seems to me that one of the largest challenges, the one that's least dealt with, is, is Karaite halakha. Uh, obviously, it's a halakha which makes the most difference between Karaites and Rabbinites, whether it's a calendar, whether it's how holidays are. Uh, observed, whether it's the dietary laws, laws of uh, forbidden sexual relations. We know the general lines of development. We know that Anan and then early Karaites had a very strict view of in laws of incest. They were uh, moderated by uh, uh, Yeshua ben Yudah in, in the 11th century, and then further modified by Elijah Basyach in the 15th century. We know there are different schools. We know about internal tensions. But what exactly, how exactly did the halakha develop? What about Judah Hadassi? What is his role in the development of Karait halakha? What was his role when future generations <coughs> copied his work, even though the halakha was different than the halakha as it was developing? How do we evaluate the reforms of the Bachachi family? 
What about the differences between the halakha in Eastern Europe and the halakha in the Middle East? Namely, between the Basyachi school and, for instance, Samuel Magrabi, whose work was translated into Hebrew in the 18th century. Why suddenly is there an interest in 18th century Eastern Europe in 15th century Karite, Egyptian Karite halakha? How is Karite halakha observed in practice? For instance, something I asked, and so far I haven't gotten a clear answer, is did Lithuanian Karites really have no heat in their houses in the winter? I mean, I can understand how Karites in Egypt did not heat their houses in the winter, and maybe Byzantium, but in Lithuania? Uh, was pre-modern charism as halakho-centric as was rabbinism? So these are some of the areas, the thematic areas, but there are also questions of place and time. For instance, Golden Age gets most attention, most people here deal with Golden Age, the land of Israel in the 10th century, 10th and 11th centuries, grammar and language. But what about Byzantium? Byzantium has not gotten much, uh, perhaps since Ankori, 50 years ago. I wrote about philosophy there, but what about halacha? What about the exegesis? Is this period not fashionable? Is there some reason it's not fashionable? Eastern Europe seems to me is the new frontier because the questions of Jewish identity and cultural transfer uh, and all the new material uh, available. Uh, I mentioned the study of the cemeteries, but it would be also nice to study the Karaites there before they died. And what about contemporary Karaism? I think there's much to interest the student of Karaism, the Israeli community, the issues of assimilation, the culturation into a larger Jewish community. The fate of Egyptian Karaites who came to Israel as compared to those who went to other countries, such as the uh, United States. Uh, so we have a large agenda here, and I don't think we'll finish it, but I hope we'll provide food for thought and that the con conversation will continue. Uh, I'd like to end with one additional issue, which is, can we determine <coughs> who is a Karait? <coughs> what I mean by that is that in response to my latest article, The Attitude of Karaites to Christianity, I received an email from Eliezer ben Ephraim HaKohen, who is listed as a board member of the Karite Jewish University, the internet site which, among other things, trains potential converts to Karite Judaism. Uh, my correspondent, whose other name is Elliot Geyer, thanks to Moshe Figueroa who's providing me that information, <laughs> objected to my discussing the attitudes toward Christianity of contemporary Europe, Eastern European Karites since the, movement, the moment they accepted Jesus in any way whatsoever, they are no longer Karites. It also solves the problem of Karite, possible Karite collaboration with the Nazis in World War II. They aren't Karite Jews, they're some other group. Uh, Nehemia Gordon's website, I'll show it in a minute, uh, has an article about Karites in the Holocaust, and he says they aren't the same people. Um, when Karites in Eastern Europe remove themselves from, being, from Judaism, are they no longer Jews? Are they no longer Karites? <coughs> are they still proper subjects for inquiry? and who will determine these things. And what I'd like to show now is a short presentation about all the different groups, some, not all, some of the many groups that use the term Karaites today. Uh, I assume Ari Moshe Firuz knows a little bit more about them than I do, but hit the lights. Okay. This is the official site of the Israeli Karaites, Universal Karaite Judaism. It's karaite.org.il. You may recognize one of the officiants at the wedding in the picture, who's sitting with us. Um, they, uh, I caught it with that banner, with that picture, there, but the pictures do change. There's lots of information about the community. This is the official, uh, the official site. If you notice at the very bottom of the, of the screen, there is a link there to Russian, which is indication of the fact they're now Russian Karite Olim. Um, this sort of replaces Bita uh, Own B'nai Mikra, those of you who remember that bulletin from many years ago, uh, even has recipes which the original Bita Own B'nai Mikra had. 
This site, uh, Karaim.net, was the unofficial site of Israel Karaites. It was run by Moshe Firuz before he became chief rabbi. Uh, I think it's more member-oriented with, uh, with forums, and you can see the discussion groups and uh, logging and whatever. So we're still discussing in the, the sort of the official Karaites, the official Karaite community, or what the majority Karaite community. These are the Karaite Jews of America who are basically related to the Israeli Karaite community. Um, this is a picture of the city of, of the synagogue there in California, in the, in the uh, Bay Area, um, and they cooperate with the community here. And if one looks at the calendar, the Karaite calendars, uh, which I was going to bring, I don't know if I brought them, uh, their, their uh, <coughs> people are listed there. This is the website of the uh, orachsadikim.org, uh, community, Karai community in Albany, New York. There are some Karaites. These are of uh, also Egyptian Karaites. I don't know. They don't have a synagogue. Though. No. no. But they just but they do have a website. Um, for instance, the website, which is a congratulations to Chacham Moshe Ben Yosef Firuz on election for Chief Chacham. So it's still part of the Egyptian Karaite family. And I mentioned the Karite Jewish University that, uh, if you can see in the upper right-hand corner, it says, welcomes both convert and Jew. It's part of an on outreach program which results in the conversion of non-Jews to Karite Judaism. Uh, I don't know what effect this will have on the law of return. I used to have this fantasy of a, a, a non-Jew convert to Karism who arrived at the airport, Ben Gurion airport, and asked to be accepted under the law of return. And I always said, but it wouldn't happen because Karaites no longer accept converts. Well, now Karaites accept converts, and uh, it may someday make for an interesting, <coughs> interesting court case. Uh, the next one is certainly an unofficial uh, um, site, karaitecorner.org. This is Nehemiah Gordon's site. I mentioned Nehemiah before. He's a former rabbinite, the way he tells the story, when he was in yeshiva as a child and asked questions, they said to him, don't ask questions like that, you're a Karaite. So he decided to find out something about Karaism, <laughs> and the rest is history. Um, as far as I can tell, uh, this, this is not uh, definitely not an official site, but one of the things that the Karaite Corner does is uh, have Aviv settings, sightings, uh, and a few years ago, uh, Nehemiah Gordon and his followers uh, observed Passover a month before the rest of the Jewish community, both Rabbinite and Karite. You can also get his newsletter for sightings of the new moon. Uh, this is, uh, so this is his spot. All right. Now we're going to get to some sites which I think are further and further away from what we know as charism. And I'm very sorry that Barry Wolfish has not yet made it here. He would otherwise see karaitecanada.webs.com. I noticed they had 22 members, mostly identified by nicknames. This is a very Canadian site. If you can read it, it says, those with aggressive, hegemonic, and disrespectful behavior will be asked to leave. So uh, this is Canadian karaites. I have no idea where they are, who they are. No idea. Uh, it's for the next site is karaim-institute.naro.ru, uh, Crimean Karaites. It does, does not appear to be updated or maintained. I'm sorry, Don Shapiro is not here. He could tell us more about these uh, Karaite groups. Many of them uh, have websites in other languages. Maybe Henrik Jankowski can tell us more about some of these European sites. This apparently was intended to be a general um, clearinghouse for information about Eastern European Karaites. Um, <coughs> many Karaites consider, uh, scholars consider Karaites the sense of Khazars, Opolovitz tribes, accepted Karaism or Karaimimism, religion of Torah without any, in other words, it's, it does not accept a uh, connection to Judaism. This is, the website is called www.submissiontothelord.org. B'nai Mikra Ministries, run by Chacham Shlomo Golopter, 
who apparently is a newcomer to charism, and he is located in uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Okay. Um, the next one is kahalbanamikra.org, which is in Hedgesville, Berkeley County, in eastern panhandle of West Virginia. So this is a Karite community there. These are, these are, some of these are the converts, no? Yes. Yeah. Um, next one is Brit Chadash Karim. The, the site is uh, www.webjam.com slash Karim. Tehuda Reform Karai Judaism. If you notice the uh, number five on their list, number six, I'm sorry, number six in the list of their principles, uh, we believe Avram is the father, the Rabboni Yeshua ben David Avram was the suffering servant Moshiach, and there's only one God, and Muhammad was his prophet, and there will be a future Messianic kingdom which will rule the earth in peace from Jerusalem. I cite this in my article on charism and Judaism, which is one of the reasons why I got a unpleasant criticism in terms of the fact that obviously this person is not a Karite, can't represent charism, but uh, at least it's a curiosity. I don't know who he is. Um, next one is called KaraiteInsights.com. If you notice the banner, the, also these change, the, uh, the, the, the mottos change, but getting a rabbinical Jew to give up his Babylonian idol worship, rabbinical Judaism, is harder than getting a heroin addict to give up his heroin. This is a site of Melech ben Yaakov. The next one is KaraiteJudaism.org. These are the teachings of Chazan Yochanan Zakan Tov. On the Kaal B'nai Kras site, he's identified as I Lamba Barb, and he's the Dean of Students at the Karai Jewish University. He's also home of the writings of Chacham Meir Yosef Rechavi, who's the Chancellor of the Karai Jewish University. This is the Hebrew Karim community Ibo B'nai Yisrael from Nigeria. If you read it, it says the Igbo, Igbo Israelites are people of Nigeria who practice the Karite Hebrew Hebraic religion. They are said to be descended from North African or Egyptian Hebraic and later, later Israelite migrations into West Africa. Oral legends amongst the Igbo state that migration started about 1,500 years ago. They uh, write here a supreme theological council, Chacham Gershom Kohen Kipritzi, who is a Chacham Bashi of the Crimea and Karites in Western Europe. USA and Israel, a theologian and musician. He's located in Holland. Some of you may see him occasionally in the National Library. Chazan Libor Nisim Valko Opragi and Chazan Chaim Khan Malkasi. The next are the Isawiya Israelite Mosque of Karaisms. This seems to be some synchronistic group. I cannot quite figure out who they are. Uh, I don't think the building is a Karite synagogue, as far as I can tell <laughs> in the picture. And the last one is voluntarycharism.com, run by someone named Kenneth Lefebvre, who explains how he made the leap from charism to anarchism. So, maybe charism isn't as boring as it sometimes appears. I look forward to our four days of discussions. Thank you. Especially not of the few lists. You can ignore them. If it's related to Karai, you can ignore them completely. So who's a Karai? So who calls himself a Karai? If you if you ask from the formal question or the electric question, or it depends on the points of view. Mainly, there is no in, in the in the past. There was a, the, the mindset or the idea that if you weren't born to a Karite father, you are not a Karite. But uh, after the great change in the last years, which means that Karite already accepting we, the, the Jewish sages in Israel, uh, accept converts, which means 
this change there in the point of view to anyone who accepts Karaite concepts and practice them. Okay, you need to practice them as well, not just to believe them. You are becoming Karaite. So this is a little bit changing the point of view, not uh, in tremendous amounts of uh, people, but uh, from the basic, from the function, who is declared as Karai, this is the <coughs> point of view. The question is, who decides? We have, we have the same question here in Israel, what is a Jew? Where some people will say, anyone who says, I am a Jew, should be accepted as a Jew. And other people say, say only, if you, only if you're a Roman Jew. Will you be accepted in Jew? And then, then, then this raises the question of, well, who decides? Um, if you are arising the question who is decides, it's, it depends what is the need of the person. If he wants to say that he's a Karite for himself, so he needs to, to someone who declares him as a Karite, he believes that he's a Karite. That's, that's the end of the discussion. But when he needs the community involved, like, uh, eating a kosher meat, okay, or doing a wedding ceremony or something like this, he needs the authority of the community. Otherwise, there is no need to, 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 to such an authority. And as long as it's uh, in Israel, in America, uh, the coaches of sages here, the Moetzel Chachamim in Israel, is the only uh, group which is uh, giving the decisions who is what. <coughs> and this is in a few words. Mm -hmm. So it's essentially the same situation as the... Uh, Almost, yes. The Generally, it's the same concept of the uh, local rabbinites, uh, uh, rabbinut here in Israel. Almost. Do you have many converts? Many. Uh, let's say that we already done uh, three uh, ceremonies, and it's a few, a few dozens, not more. But we hope that, as it seems like now, we have opened the four uh, ceremony is supposed to be close to 60. It's getting, it's spreading a little bit uh, by by now because uh, you need to people understand that disability is exists because even in here in Israel, uh, if you will take 20 years ago, even rabbinite could not be a karai. So this is something which is very, very new. Only 10, 15 years ago, something like this, a rabbinite could accept to the Karite community as a Karite member. Now, after this border was open a little bit, under a few uh, rules, yes, which means because of the incest uh, between Karite and rabbinite, there are a little bit differences regarding to the rules, but generally there are no, pro there are no problems. Uh, now, when, when the, in the last few years, when we have opened the gates to accept converts, this is changing the perspective from one another, one border to another. Now, the internet is really helping to spread the information, but it's take time. It's not so rapidly uh, spread. Why were converts not accepted? There are a few historical reasons and religious reasons. It depends. I have a, I found a, a, an academic uh, uh, article which uh, at least uh, gives um, proof that were 500 years ago under one of the Islamic countries there was there was a converse, conversion ceremony to a group of Christians that want to do a convert. So. At least from, from the papers, it exists as a, term, as a process that could be done. Now, if you look on, from the halacha point of view, if you look on the books, there is no even one sages that says that you should not accept uh, Gentiles. There are only stages what, you, what he needs to do. Okay? It's basically uh, based on the beautiful woman uh, from the from the Torah in the field of war, if you see a beautiful woman and, and wish to have her as, as your wife, there are a few steps that she, she, should, should be done, like she needs to cry uh, one month on her parents, and she needs to take her dress, cut her nails, and all the process that you are all familiar with, so no need to explain more. And uh, if you are taking a male, he needs to do a circumcision, and in the past there was 
the idea that he needs to bring a sacrifice. Now, we don't have a temple, and we don't have a, an altar, we don't do any sacrifice. <coughs> so instead, what we are doing now is a day of fast. Okay, so it's the converse that is taking the, the converse, conversion ceremony, is taking something like two days, which is uh, involved a fast in the, in, the, in the process, instead of the sacrifice that was served in the old days. Now, if you ask why it wasn't acceptable, you need to, we, need, we all understand that when Jewish and Karite lived under the Gentiles uh, uh, regime. Why do you say Jewish and Karite? Which means, in order that you understand that Karite and Jews were living always in the same place. So there wasn't a why, difference. Why are you making this dichotomy Jewish and Karite? Because I wish to emphasize things in, in my... Uh, are you saying that Karaites are not Jews by this time? No. Okay, so you should be saying Rabbanites and Karaites are not Excuse me. Uh, I mean Jews and Karaites among them, right? Yes. <laughs> it's, it's just an issue of... Uh, yes. You need to understand my English is not my native language. <laughs> and, uh, it's a good solution. In any case, when you are under a different regime, uh, there are things that you wish to... Uh, secure your own uh, community. You don't want to make or even give the option that your uh, people will be mixed with the Gentiles or something like this because you know that it could rule or destroy the local community. So this is one of the reasons why it wasn't done. If you will take the Eastern Europe uh, community, at least from what I have uh, able to put my hands on the material, which is written in majority in Russians and things like this, was the idea that usually Karaite Jews relate a got a better, a civil uh, situations uh, uh, better than Garbanites, which means they they got somehow the ability not to go to the army and uh, less taxes from the Rabbanites, and there was a rule, and I have the document in Russian somewhere that says that. Uh, if you, if a Karai Jew will marry a Rabbanite Jew, he will lose his rights. Mm -hmm. So this was one of the things why Karaite rejected the idea of getting married with Rabbanites because they will lose their rights under the Russian regime, something like this. So until when? It was, I think, in the 17th century, 18th century, something like this. Uh, I have the document. To, I'm sure that you are, it's, it's very famous document. It's not, it's not a secret, yes. <laughs> but uh, this is the from the religious uh, uh, points in the Eastern Europe. Now, in, in the Muslim countries, you are all familiar with the idea that you cannot switch, change your uh, convert your uh, your religion. You are Jewish or you are a Christian. If you wish to. Change as Professor Lasker told me once. You need to upgrade, upgrade as, <laughs> as you need to. You can be a Muslim, but you cannot change between. So this is another issue which made the problem. So if we take all these parts together, this is why it couldn't be done. But now when we are in Israel, we are under own, uh, at least I hope, under own uh, regime. We can do whatever we want. So this is why it took a few years to slowly, slowly uh, leave all the barriers that were existed and to our present uh, situation. So you started the process? Of yes. Uh, when I was a secretary to the Coalition of Sages, I started, I started the process. I spoke with the Professor Chief Rabbi and the head of the, the dean and uh, show them the papers and the write the idea. There were a few discussions regarding to the options, how it should be done and if and how. And um, after a long discussions, we have uh, approved the KJU, which is Kara Jewish University, the Professor Laskett has shown the, uh, the website, which I'm a member of the KGU as well, and we are doing all the converts, and all the teaching, all the uh, interviews with them, and all the process, including and once a year or a year and a half, I'm flying to 
America to the community in uh, San Francisco to the synagogue, which you saw the picture of it today, and doing the ceremony. What's the main motivation for conversion? Is there any specific main motivation, or is a variety of personal reasons? The majority of the converts are reaching to us from their uh, bad experience with Rabbanites. <laughs> Which means, usually they say, uh, I can show you hundreds of papers. Uh, we, we have got to the idea that uh, Christianity is a false uh, religion, and we have uh, learned years, and then we got to the idea that we wish to be a Jewish. So they went to the close Jewish synagogue that they had. And then they started the process of uh, conversion or learning, and in one of the stages, they go to the Talmud. And when they got the idea of they, they need to believe in the Talmud, they rejected it again. They said, okay, this is a, another, new, another uh, new testament for us. We really do not want to accept this. And they have, um, some of them were uh, informed about their car rides. Some of them were uh, rejected completely. And then when they reached to the car ride, uh, in the, to us, and they, this was their motivation to be a car ride. Seeking for the truth, as they, uh, especially they were. Are all Christian? The majority of them Christians, we have one of them Muslims somewhere in Europe. So you say, what about Rabbanite Jews? We do not convert Rabbanite. We accept them to us. Jews are Jews if they are Rabbanite or they are car rides. Rabbanite, there are a few reasons. There are Rabbanites who usually, if it's the male, which is a Karite, and the female is a Rabbanite, and they wish to get married, so they have two options. All the couple are doing the ceremony in the Rabbanite's uh, sort of Rabbanut, or they are doing their wedding in the Karite uh, Rabbanut. So if the couple do want to marry under the Karite, uh, authority, so the person, which is, let's assume that it's the man, need to learn a few uh, basic things in order to understand what is Kara, because not like the Rabbanite uh, wedding ceremony, if you look clearly in the Kara wedding ceremony, the groom and the bride are swearing to do and to keep their rules according to the and you are moon and to the uh, Aviv and all the things that are uh, enforcing them to behave like the Karaite way. So we do not want to make someone to, to take the vow because, before he understands exactly what he's doing. So he needs to first to learn. After he learns and then, then he accepts the Karaite way, then he fulfills a few documents, papers that he wish to, to join the Karaite community. And then he's a Karite member, like any car other Karite member. And then he can do the wedding. This is one uh, point. The second point is that are Jewish, Rabbanite Jews, that learn the Torah and Talmud and other issues and reject it. And wish to, and, and somehow, in Hebrew is easy than in English, of course, to do so, because there is much more material to learn. They reach to our uh, synagogues or centers or whatever, and they learn and they join to the community. At least in the Sheva here, we have at least more than one or one that uh, is a rabbinite Jew, and he learned that all the rules, and he's coming, praying with us, doing all the uh, ceremonies with us, like any other kind of mission. Okay, thank you. We're going to have to take a break now.